You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number five eight two. The real uh, sunrise is not so impressive, but the color or the shining of the sun very impressive because that is the background of the temple reflection, uh, reflection the color to the temple, and the towers of the temple anchor what reflection to the water. That is a good spot to take pictures. We get. Uh, reflection to the water and the colorful. Some days very red and pink color with the temple and the uh, and reflection to the water. Yes, so that place we will go to the, uh, where we are going to that place sorry, to take picture. But with the real sun, actually, the real sun very strong. We can't see, we can't take picture, the sure. real sun, yes. Very strong sun, yes. but the color is very impressive. And <coughs> also, uh, we walk in the middle of the temple right here. For the towers of Angkor Wat Temple, we can see at least three towers. But actually, the temple with five towers if we stand at the corner we will see five but from the middle here we can see only three so the three towers of the temple that the national flag of Cambodia you can see the national flag yeah. with the three towers yes. that's Samart our guide giving us an introduction to Angkor Wat we rose at 4 a.m so we could have the sunrise experience and it's almost 5 a.m. as we make our way with him and hundreds of other tourists to view this unique spectacle. Yeah, so <coughs> for Angkor Wat Temple first they built the temple they start dig the moat just the moat around here yeah. for protection with the water for protection the foundation of the temple because the foundation of the temple that was built by the, the, the sand and the lava stone so the foundation with the sand that need water around here we call moat when the sand wet the temple stable. Be careful with the water. You can move here. Yes. Yes, when the sun wet, the temple stable. Strong. That's why <coughs> we can see Angkor Wat and other temple. Angkor Wat is much better than another temple. Especially during abandoned time. Yes, because Angkor Wat with the monks protected, look after, and also with the water protect the foundation of the temple. This is we're talking about engineering and architecture. We're talking about the religion. This temple, the king built for Hindu. That focus on the god Vishnu. So. The temple, the main temple of Angkor Wat, that is a place of uh, the god in Hindu, we call Vishnu, Shiva and Brahma. They are located in the middle of the ocean. So the temple, the place of the god, the water or the moat outside the temple refer to the ocean. And the causeway or the bridge we are walking on now, we call, be careful with the word. <coughs> We call Rainbow Bridge, crossing the ocean to get the place of the God. This is the 
religion concepts, religious concepts, sorry. And yeah, if you have a look in the front of us, we can see three gates of the temple. So the middle one, the highest one, that for the king in the ancient time, just for the king. And another two for high priest, commander, the king family. And at two at the corner, we call elephant gate. That is the gate for the elephant and common people. So at that time, they have a separate classes of the people. The king is the king, high priest, the king family and commander are combined together. But common people, they have another difference. So they have a different classes of the people because we just follow from Indian people. So Indian people actually they have three classes. They still practice right now. Indian people, they have three classes. King, yeah. high priest, rich and poor. I think the first thing to explain and the assumption that most people make is Seam Reap, Angkor Wat and there's just one big temple or a temple complex there. But in actual fact there are hundreds of temples in the area and the history of the building of them and so on is so complicated. There's a lot of conflict that's taken place between the Buddhists and the Hindus and now the Buddhists and the different variations of religion the way it changed of the temples and the kings at the time are quite confusing and there's a lot of conflict that has gone on between Buddhists and Hindus and so some of the temples started off Buddhist related and then were defaced and replaced by Hindus and uh, it, yeah, it gets very very complicated. The more temples you go and see the more complicated it gets because different temples are allocated to different gods for different reasons at different times in history. But to just try and clarify what we had sort of purchased and what we were expecting, when we spoke to Martin, our guide initially back in Phnom Penh, he put us in touch with uh, Samart and Samart offered us a one, two or three day excursions uh, some of which included the uh, floating villages which we didn't really want to go and see and we only had time to have two days so we booked two days allocated to go and see the temples and the temples have different circuits they have a small circuit and a big circuit and basically he arranged a tuk-tuk driver to chaperone us wherever we wanted to go he was in control of the direction, the route that we would take, and it cost us $18 a head per day, which in actual fact was good value for money because there was a lot of time spent traveling from A to B, a lot of history, uh, a lot of local knowledge was shared, and uh, it proved to be a very educational and enjoyable couple of days. But I was quite templed out fairly soon, uh, Rose has a little bit more patience than me when it comes to history and temples so she's going to go into more detail of how the days unfolded for us Yeah, it was, I mean it was lovely to go to Angkor Wat which was the first temple on the agenda as you might expect which is the big one which everyone knows um, but for me it was there were so many people so many people I, uh, I didn't really enjoy it. although you did take me to heaven and back because right in the middle <laughs> there, there's a really tall tall um, tower which is very steep to climb up and um, it apparently if you, you climb it it's it is heaven um, and actually that was the only place they were really strict about dress um, because I've been told shoulders and knees had to be covered so I'd worn long trousers and a, um, a long sleeve top um, but actually that was the only place that they really um, Checked. Checked and it's respectful. And also I had to take my hat off, didn't I? You did I? have to take your hat off, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they've, they've replaced the... Well, they haven't replaced. They've covered the original stone steps yeah. with a wooden staircase, 
which actually is, is still incredibly steep, but at least you've got something to hold on to. Yeah, yeah, it's much easier. One of the temples we did later also had very steep sides, which, you know, we were invited, we were allowed to climb up, um, and they were quite hairy, actually, I have to say. Uh, I'm pretty good with heights, but they were pretty, especially in the heat, um, quite daunting. Yeah. So Angkor Wat for me wasn't, wasn't um, I was underwhelmed, I think, which sounds awful because it's an amazing place. But some of the other temples I enjoyed more. And in actual fact, the sunrise was OK, but nowhere near as spectacular as some of the pictures that you see to encourage you to go there. But if you're lucky, uh, it is a once-in-a-lifetime visit and uh, well worth the effort of getting up at four o'clock, which actually wasn't too bad, was it? No, but by about three, it was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> we were shattered. Yeah. Yeah. So um, after that, we went off to um, Bantare Sri Temple, which is actually it was quite a long ride out on the tuk-tuk, about 40 minutes, and not in the usual um, itinerary of temples. So I did sort of ask why it had been chosen. Um, and some art sort of implied that he'd chosen the temples because he thought they were the most interesting or illustrated something particular. And this particular temple that we took about 40 minutes was actually quite nice after Angkor Wat just to go through the countryside and through the villages um, t- to get to it. It was quite a small temple. It was called the Citadel of Women and um, the carvings were exquisite considering they're thousands of years old. They still retain the pink sandstone colour and they really were just incredible. I mean you could put your finger, your little finger sort of in to the first joint. They were that deep. And, and still so clear, amazing. And the, the actual, I was fascinated by just purely the mechanical engineering and the construction of them. And it transpired with some art later on. We, they discovered, they excavated one of the temples and actually went down to see how deep it went. And what they discovered is the temple's foundations were as deep as they were tall and they used the two types of rock. They used sandstone and they used lava rock. And basically, they built the frame of, if you like, the foundations with lava rock and then filled it in with sand and then used the sandstone for all the carvings on the face of the rocks, on the face of the stone. Um, And once you sort of understood that part of the architecture, let alone the actual uh, way they put the bricks together, it really is mind-blowing, let alone, let alone the fact that here you are in the middle of dense jungle, which may or may not have been, I suppose, dense jungle at the time, and somewhere somebody has got to ship millions of tonnes of these stones in the 11th and 12th century from their source to the location. And then, based on our experience the previous day of looking at the artisans, the amount of work that would have gone into doing all the carvings must have taken years. It, it Just the logic of putting it all together and somebody somewhere had planned these, obviously, these temples and dedicated them to the different gods. Phenomenal. I mean, the designs were just, when you think of it that way, the designs, and actually some of them were built relatively fast, you know, within five years. Um, some of the complexes, there was one temple which got abandoned because... It had. It was considered an unlucky because of different wars had interrupted it. In the end, they just left it and didn't complete it. Uh, can you imagine someone starting construction and um, saying, "Actually, we're we're just going to put a pull the plug on this one because it's not the right place. It's got bad vibes. We'll just leave it, <laughs> walk away." Just uh, amazing. Um, but some of the other temples too were just uh, uh, beautiful. Um, I asked Samart which his favourite was uh, temple was, and he said Bayon, which is one with lots of smiling Buddha faces, which are really happy, so it's a really nice thing. And he was actually a, a Buddhist monk for 10 years, so I think that's p- partly why he's uh, so fond of that particular temple. There was another one which was really interesting, which was Prikni Prong, which had um, a sort of a, a, a small tower in the middle set in a lake, and then it was surrounded by four smaller pools, which was quite pretty and very t- tranquil, apparently for healing. They'd put different herbs in the lakes, and then people with different illnesses would come and sit in them. Um, obviously, we went to the Tomb Raider temple, Tar Prom, which I still think is amazing with the trees growing through it. I mean, I, I enjoyed that very much. Um, and the other one, which sort of sticks in my memory, 
can't remember what it was called. The one, it was in the middle. What had happened was in originally it was designed to be in a lake, but in the latter years it had just dried up, so it was just not in a lake. And then apparently in something like... Um, Late well, 90s, know, wasn't it? No, it was early 20s, because it was 2011 when it was finished. Basically, Seam Reap got flooded really badly, the whole area, and the authorities decided they needed to do some sort of dam work or sort something out. Um, and the guy who's in charge of sort of canals and all that sort of stuff discovered that actually there was a whole system of canals and sluices... Which they hadn't kept clear which, for, for which obvious they reasons. they didn't realise existed or whatever. Anyway, basically they reinstated them all and that in turn flooded around this temp- particular temple, which is now... Um, so, so 2011 they, they did that, so now it's just... So re- basically it reinstated the moat around the temple and when I say that, when you look at Angkor Wat in the pictures, you see a moat which is probably, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 metres across. This particular moat was probably the best part of 100 metres across, wasn't it? Yeah. So we had to go across a, a walkway that obviously that was suspended over this moat and it was about uh, three or six feet deep. But this, this square lake then went around this temple complex. It, it was fascinating that they could, that all the sluices and canals, all the architecture existed already to alleviate a problem of flooding and at the same time hold up the foundations because all the temples or a lot of the temples have water around them because apparently it makes the sand wet that they're built on and the wet sand then gives them a solid foundation whereas dry sand it'll, the, the foundations run out underneath them Got that right, have I? The lava stone is, forms the frame they fill the centre of the frame with sand and the combination of that and then the water apparently gives it the stability that then stops the sand from washing away, I presume. Yeah, yeah, it does indeed. There's so many questions, all of which, some of which can't be answered or because the history has is, is disappeared. Especially the one temple we went to, and there was, there's a carved stegosaurus. Ah, yes. How on earth do they... It, honestly, it really looks like a stegosaurus. I took a photo of it, and it's like, how did they know there were stegosauruses? The carvings in the temples were also there to explain the story of the kings and why they built the temple so all these reliefs showed battles and showed characters within the battles and what they were wearing and all the different layers and social society um, from the, and the food they ate and all the rest of it so the, the detail that was in the carvings was extremely educational and that enables people to understand the history of how the temple came into being and who it was there to serve. But then just randomly on one particular column, there's this stegosaurus. Uh, And there are lots of other animals there, all equally beautifully carved, but it seems to be the only one that's completely out of place historically and people are confused whether they were possibly still around or somebody's imagination. I have no idea, but it was definitely a good talking point. And the Tomb Raider Temple was very picturesque, a great experience, but like everything else these days, um, unfortunately, it, there's now walkways and routes you have to follow and everything's roped off, so it doesn't quite give you the romantic feeling that you got in the Tomb Raider film. But they were very um, pleased with the relationship they had as a country with Angelina Jolene because she returned the year following and I think has and since become obviously a... Uh, uh, an ambassador as well so um, it was it was good promotion and support and they all refer to it and she also adopted a couple of um, Cambodian children didn't she yeah so, yeah and as, as always photographs and contact details or links or anything will be on the show notes which I will only be able to complete when I'm back so do if you, any of this tickles your fancy and you want to see a little bit more then do check out the social media and do check out the outdoor station website where there will be a lot more information but as you can understand I'm traveling very very light and we're just managing to get the podcast completed and out to to share the story really share the journey as you can imagine it was an exhausting day it was a very hot day exhausting day but we were well looked after and as Rose said earlier on we were completely shattered by three o'clock four o'clock 
So we went back, had a shower, and then decided to go out for a, an early evening meal. And we'd heard about a restaurant called Haven. And the reviews were really good. It was not particularly expensive, certainly not in the super expensive area at all. And we found out when we got there the full story. We had a fantastic meal, and I spoke with the owner, Sarah, at the end uh, to find out more and share her particular story in relation to seam rape. Well, we started back in 2011, so uh, this has been up and running now for 13 years, uh, yes. Um, but it actually started back in 2008 when my husband and I were on a world trip and um, really just traveling the world, not looking for a new home, uh, but came to Cambodia and just fell in love with the people, honestly, and connected with them instantly. And then instead of staying two or three weeks, we stayed seven months. We kept extending our visa. And it was during that time that we got to know a lot of people because we were mainly in Siem Reap, uh, which was a very different place 16 years ago. Um, yes, and, and we got to know a lot of, especially NGOs, uh, people working in NGOs, uh, running organizations. And it was during that time when we realized that there were so many places taking good care of kids, most of them really good care. Uh, but it was, the focus was always on the kids while they're kids, but as soon as they outgrew the organization, they would drop out of the system. Mm -hmm. And we started asking questions about where do they go then? You know, like they, everyone was just talking about when it's finished, but not what, the, that, what that actually meant. So we started asking, what does that mean? Where do you go? Do you have a family or community to go back to? Do you want to go and study? Can you even study? Like all these questions and everyone back then was just like, haven't thought about that yet or don't know where to go. And, and the kids had so many ideas of things that they said what they would like to do, become a teacher or a tour guide and, and all these things, but they knew they had, to, they had to study or go to extra schools or things like that for that. Um, but they didn't have the financial means, not the family to support them to do that or anything like that. So we started thinking about those kids and about what would be a good next step for them. So instead of just creating another NGO that where they would get financial support and be taken care of and money would just be handed out, what could be done to make them self-sustainable that they can actually earn their own money and take care of themselves and their future families, of course, as an effect. And so we, at one point, we suddenly thought of the apprenticeship programs that we have in Switzerland, which is a very common concept. You either study or you do an apprenticeship, which is usually about three, four years, um, where you learn a trade. And after that, you are, you're fully employable. So we suddenly realized that would, that's a concept that's, that works so well in Switzerland. If we adapt that to here, that would work. We really believed in that instantly. And um, so it was both for both of us in that moment, we were like, we can't go back to Switzerland. Like, we have to try this. If And we both felt that way. I didn't have to convince my husband. He didn't have to convince me. It was for both of us instantly that, that drive and determination to get that up and running. And, and of course, there was also fear and uncertainty, like, will it really work here? You know, and, and can we even get it up and running? And all those things. But that didn't matter because the thought of not trying was much worse than trying and it not working. At least then we knew, you know, that it wouldn't. But it worked. I mean, for, yeah, we oh, really... I can see that. I can see that tonight. It's obviously worked exceptionally well. So if you were doing your world trip at the time... Yes. Did you sort of cut all ties with Switzerland and any commercial commitments that you must have had at the time? Yeah, um, pretty much. As we continued with our world trip. That was one of the decisions because we knew once we start this, we probably won't be able to yeah, travel anymore. Yeah, yeah. So we used that time working on the concept already. So we kept on traveling, but we were already working on the concept and everything. And then returned to Switzerland and came home and were like, we're only going to stay for one year. We're going to finalize the whole project and do fundraisings to get it all started and everything like that. But we're not staying like we have this new thing we need to do and um, 
Yeah, so we started working again, but we told our new employers already from the beginning this is not a long term. We'll be doing this one year, maximum two, if we can't make it in one. Um, that was very clear from the beginning. Even the part, like we, we sold everything we had before we went on the world trip. Okay. So that was already gone. And when we came back, we just uh, did uh, house sittings. So we didn't even get our own place anymore because we, it, for us, that was really just a temporary return to then leave permanently. Yeah. And it also keeps your mindset very much in transit it as does. well, doesn't it? Rather it does. Than I've, I'm, the roots start to grow again. Yes, when you settle yeah. down again, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, two things then. Uh, obviously, this is a, it's a wonderful restaurant uh, scenario you've got here. So the question is, do you have or your husband have catering background and knowledge and management and that sort of thing? And the second thing is... is the integration into the Cambodian society, but obviously the politics, the actual, uh, the whole um, emigration, mm -hmm. has that been relatively painless? Oh, those were a lot of questions, actually. Okay, I think well, with each one I could fill a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, where shall I start? I mean, the integration part, um, I, think, I think Cambodia is a very friendly, welcoming country, definitely. Right. So... Um, Back then, even 16 years ago, there were even less. There was even less paperwork. Uh, I think it's getting more organised now, which I actually think is really good because it's much more clear what you need to do and what you need to bring and and, and what are your rights and all those things. So that's actually I I, I like that, um, and it makes the place safer. I think as well with certain rules of who can stay and how long but that's like I said that goes into a completely different topic sure sure um, but are you, I mean are you, are you a citizen now not a, well we have a, a per, like a permanent visa that oh, we okay. yes okay. so we can work here it's, it's on my name and everything the, the whole business yeah. the social enterprise and everything like that so and the, and the catering question then the catering question um, would be a simple no okay. no <laughs> so, <laughs> well that's uh, honest <laughs> Um, well, kind of. I mean, Paul is a food engineer specialized in microbiology and hygiene, so he was consultant back in Switzerland for hotels, restaurants, uh, hospital, canteens, um, all that for hygiene and training people on that, okay. plus at a hotel school t teaching that. So that was, but never actually worked in a restaurant. Um, oh, and he was a trained baker as well. That was before he then went studying. So that's kind of close. For me, I come from the communication side, so I was head of marketing for a vegetarian restaurant chain, a family-run one in Switzerland, a very popular one, um, and I, I feel I learned, well, that was one of many jobs, but that was the last job I had before we left for our world trip, and um, a lot of project management as well that I've been doing in the past, so I'm kind of more the organizing kind of person. I did get a lot of insights at that restaurant as well, but never really operational either. I was in the back office. But still, I feel like that really inspired me because the founders of that restaurant were also not from the, from the area, but they were so passionate about vegetarian and veganism in a time when it was not yet cool. And they made it cool, and they were so successful, and that was just with pure passion and dedication. And I feel like that was something that gave me... Yeah the confidence or the just to be brave enough mm, to feel excellent. like we can do that if you believe in it you can do it okay so let's just go, come to where we are now then just uh, to give listeners a bit of an outline of exactly what you do with the young people you've got working here and obviously who trains them yeah um so the whole training is a one-year training um when they come, they come to us from the different organizations that I mentioned before, which is the whole, why the whole idea came up, right? So the young adults that drop out of that system and they come, we're kind of like the place where we take those that want to learn hospitality, of course. No one, we don't force anyone. No, okay. um, and we have hired teachers in the different areas, of course, that are specialized and have been trained in those areas. So like everyone in the kitchen, our head chef and sous chef, um, they're all people that trained. We didn't have a backup plan for that. You know, when we came and we started this all, we knew we have to find a professional head chef because mm. we can't cook. Mm. So, and we found our head chef and he's been with us since day one. So it's actually the three of us who have built it all up. And he's the one who has made Haven what it is from the culinary side and also the whole training in the kitchen. That's right. all his. 
Paul, my husband, uh, does still does all the hygiene trainings, everything that's to do with uh, dietaries and um, allergies and like very detailed. Yes, yeah, so you've got to be on top of that these days, yes, haven't you? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, so we, we have different teachers. We have English teachers. We also have life skills and soft skills teachers. Okay. We have uh, um, different NGOs that we work with as well that are specialized in different areas, uh, like women's rights or labor law, so that they know what their rights are as well. I think that's really important as well. So it goes so much more. It's you know Teaching someone how to cook or be a good waiter is one part, and that's actually the easiest part. Yeah, yeah. But actually helping them grow in confidence understanding that and, and understanding the life skills isn't yes. it and how it fits in with everything else exactly I think and I think that's the one thing that's definitely missing in Cambodia because of the history yes. and the wars is the old generation everybody that had that knowledge and skills are yes. no longer there to pass it on yes so they're a bit sort of um, not directionless in a deliberate way but they actually don't have somebody to hold their hand and and guide them so yeah, i think you're doing a fantastic job thank you uh, and the food is is just exceptional it thank really you. is exceptional so you know um all due credit to you making a, a great success of it and and talking about successes have uh, any of the youngsters or have all of the youngsters all found gainful employment or even started their own business well after graduating, there's a 100% job placement. So oh, every okay. single one of them gets a job afterwards. Uh, that's also part of our work. So after graduation, it's all like, okay, goodbye. Um, we do coach every single one of them into employment and also follow, you know, follow up on them and their employers, how they're doing. We're always a place they can come back to if there's a problem. Um, so we know, we know where ev- even the ones, you know, from like... 13 years ago we, we know where they are some of them by now have started their own um, little restaurant not necessarily in Siem Reap but in their homelands um, some have gone to study which is also amazing you know so it's not like every single person and that's also another criteria that we have this is the stepping stone for them yeah, yeah. and for many it's especially the ones in the, in the kitchen who have a much uh, lower education level um, they have usually have no intention of going back to school, so for them this is their career path, and those are usually the ones that really work their way up in it. But many in the front of house have actually finished high school, they would love to go and study, have no financial support to do that. So they do the waiter training, and then with the jobs that they get afterwards, and most of them go to four or five star hotels after the training here, they have enough income to start financing their studies, so we've had kids now that are teachers and engineers, um, you know, and, and, and social workers are doing completely different things than they did when they started with us. But that's also part of it, you know. It's about helping them go out there and take care of themselves in whichever direction that is. So that brings this, this particular episode to an end. I hope you've enjoyed that and some information. hope you haven't been templed out like, like we have. It must have been. It is exhausting but fascinating at the same time. We'll be back with the next episode with a, a little bit more information about the uh, Seam Reap and the temples. But more interestingly, I did an interview with Samart, the guide, about his life, uh, how he grew up, things that have happened to him, through the years and how he became a guide which I thought was quite interesting so I hope you enjoy that and I'll see you in the next episode until then thanks for listening and bye for now thank you for listening to this podcast to hear or see more from our extensive free library please visit theoutdoorstation.co.uk